Hello and welcome to the National Road Safety Partnership Program webinar, Car Park Safety, Insights from the Organisational Road Safety Campaign Development. Uh, my name is Jerome Carslake and I'm the Director of the National Road Safety Partnership Program and its many activities. Um, to find out more, please visit the NHP website, register for our newsletter or even better, follow us on social media. Um, today's session is going to go for approximately 60 minutes and there's going to be plenty of time for discussion throughout. Um, we're going to be recording this session and it will be shared on the NHP website afterwards and you'll receive a link to it um, and to the PDF as well. As you can see, we have three marvellous panellists, but what we want to do is make it as interactive as possible. So please do send through your questions into the question box. Um, and there is a chat box that's open to everyone as well, and you can throw things in there. And I'm positive there'll be some interesting insights that will flow through. We're also going to have a couple of Q&As that we're going to launch as we go along, as we're keen to know some habits that we move through there. So now over to our three amazing panellists. Um, joining us today, we have Kyla Fanton. Welcome, Kyla. Hi, Jerome. Uh, also joining us is Ruby Athanos. Welcome, Ruby. Hi, Jerome. Hi, everyone. And also joining um, us is Mervyn Ray. Welcome, Merv. Hello, everybody. Um, so Kyla and Ruby are the 2021 NRCP Communication Design Interns from Swinburne University. They're part of the secret source that helps make things look so amazing. And joining us is Merv, and he's head of the Zurich Resilient Solutions for ANZ and has been with Zurich for over 30 years, first in the United Kingdom until 2003 when he moved to Perth and then later to Melbourne. Uh, Mervyn Zurich are a foundational partner of the NHP and his input from way back in 2012 helped form the program and he's been a con strong, consistent supporter since as a Zurich. So um, always passionate, outside the box thinker and has a great way of throwing different sort of curveballs out there. So we're in for a great session today. Um, over to you guys. Thanks, Jerome. Hi, everyone. So Kyla and I will just begin by giving everyone an overview and just a run through of the development and all the resources of this year's Road Safety Week campaign. So we'll just start with just a general overview. So when we got the topic given to us on car parks and car park safety, we first came up with the strategy. So we began with a communication strategy, which was with discussion with a lot of our partners, including Merv, talking about the timeline for the release and the development and all the resources that would be included. We developed our target audience and the angle we wanted to take and approach in car park safety because as you'll see, there's a lot that is covered. And then once this was done, we moved on to the research phase with the help of our two wonderful researchers and industry experts. And then that was also peer reviewed. And from there, we moved on to branding and design, which is where Kyle and I took over and that was all peer reviewed as well. So it was definitely a big team effort for this one. So you, we'll run you through how the car park came, campaign came to be and um, all of our planning and, and strategy behind it. So why did we end up choosing car parks? So we actually posed the question to some of our insurance partners and asked them what they'd like to see more of in car park campaign um, safety. Um, so the first thing they, they raised was to try to avoid being too trendy with the topic. So um, trying to avoid something that's been done to death before, such as drink driving, although it's extremely dangerous and relevant, it has been tackled before many times. So um, car parks was raised as something that might not be seen as um, so glamorous, um, but it's, it's definitely dangerous and poses a great risk to um, people on the roads. Secondly, uh, they also raised that it needed to be really relevant. Um, so it needed to relate to their claims and car parks was something that came up in it with a few of the partners um, that they're seeing a lot of in their insurance claims. So this was another um, vital point we took away. So the issue for our car park campaign is that car parks can be inherently dangerous spaces. We found that this is commonly due to their design um, the design tends to prioritise cost, which is completely understandable, but it means that safety comes in second. So we tend to see tighter spaces and minimal, if, no, if not any walkways. So we tend to mix pedestrians uh, with traffic. So that's where we're getting the main issues coming in. So the purpose of our campaign was to create awareness and inform people of the dangers of car parks. So we know we can't keep them safe at all times when they're in a dangerous space. So we want them to have the knowledge to make safe decisions when they are in car parks. 
So our target audience came down to one thing and that was people. So people driving a car, passengers in a car and people moving around cars in car spaces. And finally, our, our outcome for the campaign and our, our main goal was simply to reduce human error in car parks that results in incidents and injuries. So now we'll just take you through the research process. We cannot give this presentation without acknowledging the hard work of our wonderful researchers, Sean and Olivia. They are both Monash University master's students and they conducted all the research. Kyla and I gave them an overview and a bit of a list of everything that we'd like explored this campaign and they did that excellently. They used evidence-based scholarly articles and also conducted interviews with industry experts to get all of that research. And then from there, well, everything was separated into four key topics that were uncovered and those guided the structure and the flow of the campaign. So as we've said, everything was peer reviewed. So that was broken up into three different groups. The first was with statistics and research. So for that group, we had Sharon Neenam, who is the Associate Director at Monash University Accident Research Center. Michelle McLaughlin, who is the founder of Little Blue Dinosaur Foundation, which was started to raise awareness for children's safety in car parks. And we also had Brendan Callaghan, who is the Head of Health and Safety at Super Retail Group. So the three did interviews with children and Olivia and also peer reviewed all the research at the end and once that was all done and sorted we moved on to messaging and linguistics peer review team which really helped Kyla and I when we were starting the branding they helped us just figure out what angle we wanted to take and how we wanted to present all the information in the clearest way possible so that was Brett Rutledge and Graham Milkins who are linguistics experts from SenseMap and we also had Barbara Menuzo who was the coordinator at the International Safety Media Awards who looked over everything at the end and gave some really great feedback. And for branding and design, this was Dr. Shivani Tiagi, who is a communication design lecturer at Swinburne and also runs the Swinburne Design Bureau. Shivani helped us with minor technical design, not minor design technicalities and refinements and just making sure all of the elements of the campaign looked very cohesive. So we can't thank everyone enough for all of their support. Uh, so our wonderful Merv will take you through a lot of the research findings and a lot of the issues that came up next, but uh, for now we'll just run you through the four key topics that we do cover in the campaign and that came about from all the research. So the first one is understanding car park incidents. So this relates to the costs and the causes of these incidents. The second is safe decision making in car parks. So this relates to different types of parking you might employ and their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the third is human behavior in car parks. So this relates to psychology of parking. So why we do what we do in car parks, as well as road rage and aggressive driving and distracted driving. And then finally, we have vehicle factors in car parks. So this relates to uh, vehicle technology and how it can either help or hinder your ability to park, as well as different vehicle brands and their visibility while parking. Um, sorry, I've just seen a question come up from Ron. So Ron has asked, does research indicate any particular issue with narrow car parks and trend to larger SUVs? We do talk about vehicle, like choosing the right vehicle and narrow spaces and how to navigate these. That is included in the campaign. That's under vehicle factors in car parks, I'd say, and making the safe decisions. So we do touch on that. Yeah, this comes up quite often in our um, videos as well. We um, give some pointers and things to look out for and to avoid. So a few things that come up are larger cars um, and cars protruding on other spaces. So that's also um, pointed out there as well. So now we will just take you through the branding and design, which I'm sure you may have picked up on already throughout the presentation. And if you've had a look at the campaign, I'm sure you've seen it. So Kyla and I began by going out to car parks and taking photos of just the roads, the textures, the services, all the lines and the arrows, painted signs. And these were all used as the backgrounds for all of the different resources in the campaigns. So fact sheets, posters, videos, social media, you name it, that's all there. And that's to really give the feel that the audience is in a car park and they're in this space that is inherently dangerous and we're providing all the resources for how you can stay safe. And to really emphasize that car park feel, you'll see the word dangerous is in a rough texture. That is to make it look like it's one of the signs painted onto the road. So that's all the background. We want to keep everything very tight focused as and minimal graphics as the 
photos kind of made it busy enough. We didn't want to overwhelm people. So you'll see a lot of the graphics in videos, but it's mainly focused on the words. Everything is monochromatic except for yellow, which is a safety color. And it's often seen in car parks and highlights all key points very well. So the reason why the campaign doesn't have a specific name, you could say, as across each different resource, there will be a different heading. So for example, we have here, car parks are dangerous, keep yourself and others safe. So on every resource, it'll say car parks are, and the word dangerous will be substituted for whatever word just best sums up what we're talking about in that specific resource. So for example, if it's a poster on insurance data, it'll say car parks are expensive. And that tagline underneath could be, um, what is the cost of an incident? So that's just a little bit bespoke for every resource. So we'll just take you through a little overview of what's involved uh, included in the pack online. So we have a whole variety of different resources that can be rolled out as a campaign or can be used individually, whatever suits you best. So firstly, we have four fact sheets. These are the most detailed um, resource. You can see them here in the bottom, car parks are awkward and car parks are complex, so two different examples of them. Um, they're about two pages long and they cover each, each one covers one of the four key topics. We then have about eight posters, so um, car parks are complex and car parks are expensive, the two examples on the screen there. Um, these are a bit shorter and designed to be hung up around a workplace and have really short, sharp information to take away. Uh, then we also have uh, our social media post down the bottom there, the 51 car parks are expensive. Um, and these are, again, even shorter, um, really have one key message um, and they can be used on any social media platform. We then also have a facilitator guide that up the top there that relates or it, it takes you through how you could run the campaign as a suggestion um, and problems and, and suggestions for facilitators to overcome and to work through. Um, we also have surveys pre and post, um, attendance sheets for when it's the campaign is run, um, email banners to create awareness and um, free videos. Um, again, they cover the three main topics um, and they're about a minute and 30 long. And we, they were done by Tim Roberts from Fleet Strategy. So we can't thank him enough for that. Um, and if you'd like to see more, the, the campaign is available as you can see down the bottom on our website there um, under Toolbox Talks and Organisational Campaigns. Does anyone have any questions before we hand over to Merv? I think one's just popped up. Um, the new so, the, so the question there is that there's a new update coming out, um, should be at six to nine months, basically around the Australian standard I gather from car parks, which should due, be due to a change because cars, cars have got larger and wider back to the question that Ron sort of raised earlier. So, yeah, I guess that's a bit of a, a FYI because, um, and just sort of being aware these sort of things are coming. That would be great so, to see. So, Kyle and Ruby, I just question to you guys when you went through this, had you ever thought about car parks much until you did this campaign? We probably. <laughs> No, like, because especially because we are just recently, so I'm still on my green piece and Kyla's just gotten off them. So we've only been driving for a few years and I think we definitely didn't think about it as much at all. And we, even from the very first interviews, especially with Mer, when we started talking about reverse parking and everything, we were like, oh my God, there's already so much to think about. And that is the more we learn, it just, we've become so much more mindful about our behaviour. So definitely. Yeah, Merv's definitely converted us to reverse parking, that's for sure. That's one of the main <laughs> things. <laughs> uh, another question for you. I think this draws on, uh, like Ron's throwing another question out. Are your materials also beneficial to car park operators? Uh, as part of this, we went across and presented um, at the PACE conference, Parking Australia Conference and Exhibition 2022 in Adelaide. Do you want to talk to that a little bit? Yeah, so we were able to present this campaign um, at the conference with a whole lot of people who influence the design of car parks there. Um, and yeah, they definitely are relevant to um, like car park operators and things like that. Um, they they highlight the key issues that we found from insurance data. So they're definitely things that could be taken into consideration. We also have a section on say, 
for car parks are for workers. That's one of the posters we have. And that kind of touches on people who are responsible, like operators for car parks, on little things you can do for maintenance, just saying the lines are well painted on, there's adequate lighting, just to ensure that it's everything's as visible as possible. So all controllable elements are controlled. And what were some of the feelings you got from, I guess, the audience who, who are the owners of the car parks when you were sort of resent? What was their sort of thoughts about a campaign like this coming out? They definitely hadn't seen anything like it. I don't think, as we said before, it's something that isn't, does, isn't tend to be like a main topic, such as drink driving and things like that. So they were really surprised to see that we'd done all this research and um, really put it together really interestingly. So, yeah, that's what I found. And there's a question here from Andrew. Does the cover, uh, does this cover underground car parks? It doesn't really cover any like specific car park in general. I don't think it can be applied to really any. I know there's obviously more issues um, specific to underground car parks, but this is definitely more of a more general one. Ruby, did you want to add? Yeah, and then kind of going back to talking about adequate lighting and stuff like that, we covered that in some of the posters. And so just ensuring in, say, as car parks, say, including especially underground car parks, how they tend to be a lot darker. We're just, yeah, ensuring lighting and lines are all painted on and there's a lot more in there. So it's definitely can be applied, of course, to underground spaces. Do you think people overall, when you've gone through doing your research, do you think a lot of people just underestimate I guess the risk in car parks and they sort of move through, they just, do you think about when people cross the road, they think very carefully, they understand the risks themselves. Whereas in a car park, it's like, I'm, I'm sort of focusing on just getting to my end destination. Yeah, I yeah. think, oh, sorry. There you go. <laughs> so I think a lot of people, because what, what was brought up to us was that it's a shared space. So you've got cars and you've got pedestrians walking through the space. And I've, I've, from my perspective, I find if I'm, whether I'm driving or walking through, you kind of just tend to be thinking about what you're doing. You can be a bit mindful of what's happening around you, but not as much as you should be, definitely. And I think that was one of the key things that was raised for us as we went through this. A couple of good questions has just come in. So one here from David. Um, road rules apply to car park areas as they do to public roads. To what extent has this aspect been considered in the study campaign? Uh, we definitely highlight the importance of, um, like, that people are they're using um, car parks, other pedestrians, and that, um, yeah, as Ruby said, it's a shared responsibility. Um, we, we highlight the importance of the... Um, the signage, the speed limits, um, yeah, way like wayfinding, things like that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what we've done in terms of the road rules. Very good. I got one last question here. This may be a bit beyond um, for you. This one before you throw on to Mervin here. Here, how he sort of tied into it all. Is the ge geometric design coupled with stormwater design covered? So I'm not too sure on that one myself, but I'll throw that to you guys and you may, you may be aware of something. We were more focusing on how the, because we went in, to we wanted to target people using car parks and while we do cover and target car park operators as well and designs, we wanted to focus on the angle that car parks tend to be a rather dangerous space to begin with. So we wanted to just help people feel safe in a space and know how to stay safe in this space. So it's more focused on the user aspect than the design. But we yeah. do keep that in mind. Well said. Yeah, the target audience was people that use car parks, as mentioned before. So we weren't particularly targeting um, the car park design. Um, obviously, it is a um, an effect that we have found. But yeah, it wasn't the main focus um, in terms of the information covered. I must say, a fantastic effort. I'm super proud of what you guys have accomplished, the journey you've gone through. And, and I must admit, I think it sort of highlights the power of collaboration, sharing, working together, and sort of listening. So it's very, very much. So I think it's a great segue now um, to move on to you, Merv. You want to dive on in? Yeah, thanks, Jerome. Thanks, Ruby and Kyla. Um, no, you're, um, you've passed on control to me so I can move the slides. Thank you for that. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Some great questions already. Um, and I'm particularly worried about Ron. I think he's got some kind of covert camera system uh, here in my office because he must have seen my presentation. Uh, we will touch on uh, the topic of SUVs, car park space size. And as uh, somebody else pointed out, with the Australian standards being reviewed currently and uh, coming out uh, six or nine months from now, hopefully 
uh, that factor will be taken into account that the average car size has changed significantly. The demographic of our uh, road fleet has changed. And so that should be hopefully factored into uh, those minimum dimensions of car park spaces. That in itself, though, does cause problems with planners, designers, and so on uh, about the overall footprint that a car park uh, takes and, and having to comply with the numbers of, or minimum number of spaces in a car park and, and so forth. Um, I always feel that standards are always lagging behind, not just car park standards, but all standards, um, because often technology and other improvements are at a faster pace. Um, you know, for instance, with car parks in particular, um, I would say that we'll be waiting for the next re revision of that standard uh, to take into uh, in, to take into account uh, electric vehicle charging and, and so on, uh, just by way of example. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, excellent campaign and really pleased to be part of it. Um, you could not have picked a better person uh, for a topic that is not trendy, because I'm not trendy. So uh, excellent choice by Ruby and Kyla to pick me on this. Um, uh, very, very brief agenda. I don't need to run through it too much. We'll get right into it. I'll introduce myself and then uh, go through some of the problems, um, safe and unsafe ways to park. Uh, hopefully the video uh, near the end will work uh, because there's an emerging trend or movement to change the way we park. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, very briefly the ideal car park and then take any questions. So, um, so introduction to myself, as Jerome said, over 30 years, very kind of you, Jerome. It's actually getting close to 36 years, all working for Zurich. I was a motor fleet underwriter before I became a risk management uh, expert. Um, and I've worked in Ireland, UK and Australia, uh, arriving here uh, almost 20 years ago. I manage a team of 20 risk professionals uh, throughout Australia and New Zealand. And we provide technical risk assessments, uh, guidance and advice for uh, companies who are insured with Zurich, but also those companies who are not insured with Zurich as well. So we can, we can do freelance consultation with anyone. You don't have to be a Zurich customer for that. Um, there's 11 people within my team who are proficient and competent uh, risk professionals in uh, many aspects of motor fleet risks and exposures. And in addition to motor fleet, we, we are experts in, in property risk, business interruption, machinery breakdown, supply chain, natural hazards, climate change, liability, cyber, cargo, and marine, as if that's not enough to be getting on with. So uh, just waiting for this, there's a slight lag in getting the uh, slides to change, but uh, to set the scene, um, we undertook a, a study of the, uh, the crashes that result in claims against Zurich Insurance. Now, I should point out that Zurich in Australia do not provide personal lines, uh, private car insurance, so it's entirely commercial. Uh, and so we insure small to really large corporate fleets. And so we've uh, uh, taken a deep dive and we record a lot of precise information in our claims data. And we broke it down by incident type. Uh, overall, there's, there's 20 plus uh, descriptions for incident type. And then we can dive into that information and, and start to see the frequency and the severity of those uh, types of incidents. When we look at three incident types that are broadly linked to car parks, and those are the incident types of reversing, hitting a stationary object, and damage whilst parked. Now, we do recognize that reversing and hitting a stationary object are not solely uh, linked to parking or car parks. We'll look more about that later. But if you consider reversing, it's often a direction that we do very little of. Most, you know, 99.999% of what we do in a car is forwards, and very little is reversing. But reversing and hitting stationary objects and damage whilst parked uh, combined uh, represent 28% of the claims that are made against Zurich. On top of that, if we look at the dollars that are paid, there are 20% uh, of all the checks we write, if you like, all the dollars that we pay, 20% of everything we pay out relates to those three instant types alone. The problem here is that the average reversing or car park repair bill 
is $3,000 and it's going up. But if we take a $3,000 average repair bill, for some commercial fleets, their excess payment on their insurance policy, it could be sometimes more than that. Some policies might have a $5,000 or even a $10,000 excess or deductible, meaning that there are many incidents occurring with commercial fleets that we don't even know about. So this is really scratching the surface. So we looked into those incidents a little bit uh, more in detail and basically searched for the word park or parking uh, so that we could refine reversing and hitting stationary objects a little bit more closely aligned to parking. And we found that uh, typical parking uh, related incidents uh, account for 13% of claims notified to us and 10% of all the money that we pay out in insurance claims each year. There's still a significantly high overrepresented statistic when you consider all, all the different types of claims and incidents that can occur. Research by one of the other insurance companies here in Australia found that similar to us, 13% of their claims were the result of car park damage. So uh, whilst we're not proud of the fact, it's nice to see that it's common across the insurance industry. 53% of all stationary damage uh, incidents happen to vehicles within car parks. And that stands to reason, of course, less and less people are really parking on the sides of road uh, or parking at home. And most of the incidents are, are occurring in what we would define as a car park. 32% of all stationary damage occurs while reversing in car parks. So reversing, as I showed uh, in the previous slide, is highly represented in claims that are made to insurance companies. And when you think about how little we uh, actually travel in reverse, it is disproportionately represented. <clears throat> so, Couple of contributing factors that causes this problem with car parks, blind spots. Not only within the car park itself, especially underground par car parks, somebody mentioned underground car parks, um, they often will have greater blind spots with columns and pillars, um, but also the lighting can, can contribute to that. But the vehicles themselves have blind spots and for um, no matter what way you um, use a car park, you will reverse at some point or another. Um, and so your, your reversing uh, frequency is much higher in a car park than anywhere else you might drive a car. And by reversing, you're uh, interacting with more blind spots. Um, we've become too reliant on reversing aids. We have car park sensors that go variety of beeps and noises. Uh, we have cameras and so on, and they're very sophisticated pieces of technology, uh, but we do become reliant upon them. And we'll see later in a, in a study that was undertaken in the UK, uh, how that can actually uh, contribute to the problem. Car park designs themselves often contribute uh, to uh, the, the, the high frequency uh, incidents within a car park, particularly with things like uh, perpendicular car parking and so forth, uh, but also uh, poor quality lighting, uh, the signage, uh, wear and tear on the demarcation lines, um, and so on and so forth. The problem with car parks is that whilst they're, uh, they're necessary um, and there are certain requirements uh, under planning laws to provide a minimum number of car park spaces, uh, for, say, commercial shopping centres or offices and so on. Uh, it's very valuable real estate. And so often, you know, we find that car parks are uh, really constrained to the absolute minimum required dimensions. Uh, and that often can contribute to the flow of traffic around the car park, as well as parking in those spaces. And as Ron mentioned in his question earlier, uh, the type of vehicles, the demographic of vehicles has changed too. In addition to all of that, I mean, drivers are distracted all of the time when driving, but they're often distracted when they're in a car park. Uh, looking for a space is the number one uh, driver distraction and also interacting with other car park users, be it other vehicles, 
and pedestrians and so on. And they often are causing uh, additional distractions in addition to everything else. And then the lack of reverse parking. I am absolutely pleased to have converted Ruby and Kyla over to that, um, that secret set of reverse parkers. Um, and uh, I certainly, when I went on my journey of uh, discovery about reverse parking, uh, I too became converted. And in fact, I would feel more uncomfortable if I drove into a space than if I reversed into it. So uh, just touching on a few of these factors in a little bit more detail, uh, when we look at blind spots um, of vehicles and you take um, you know, a mid-sized sedan car on the left-hand side, you'll see there that typically the blind spot, both front and rear, is much less than some of the cars that we typically see in our, on the, our roads today. And that popularity has risen, uh, particularly amongst minivans, the large SUV type vehicles and pickups. Um, and you can see there that that then is contributing to, um, you know, the, um, uh, the movement of the vehicle, uh, particularly when moving at slow speed into very, very defined spaces. Uh, it makes it extremely difficult for the driver and it makes them more reliant upon those reversing aids. Yeah, so reversing aids, um, obviously, uh, we're probably pretty much familiar with the sensors and the fact that the uh, frequency of the beeping sound increases as you get closer to some object or, or another. Um, but be aware that as we become more reliant on technology, we become less reliant on the technique. And there are some cars out there, if you're lucky to have one, that actually will park itself. But not all cars are like that. Not all cars are equal. And not all cameras and sensors are the same. So if you're operating a fleet that included pull vehicles, for instance, um, or you were jumping into from one car into another, you may be fam more familiar with the sensors in one vehicle as opposed to the other. And of course, the art of the, the, the technique of actually reversing that we were taught uh, you know, when we were much younger, um, you know, that quickly gets lost with all these reversing sensors and aids. A study was undertaken in the United Kingdom and they found that 44% of drivers in that uh, study were heavily reliant on the technology to park the car. And they felt that they literally could not park without the technology. And that equates to 12 million uh, drivers or road users in the UK, uncomfortable parking without that technology. <clears throat> so the problem is, if you take the te technology away, the drivers uh, might park and drive in unsafe ways because they have lost that skill. Just on that, Merv, as well, just, just an interesting thing. So with the NRSHA pay, uh, you've been seeing as part of the REACT panels as well. And it's just an interesting thing, as part of the survey of younger drivers, a lot of younger drivers perceive a safer vehicle is one that had reversing cameras on it and was well maintained rather than actually five star ANCAP or used car safety rating. But if it had that and chatting with ANCAP about it, they're like, well, people seem to fail to understand that you're going forward a lot more than back. So <laughs> Yeah, you're you're right. Young you're, you're right. Young people did feel that um, a good indication of a safer vehicle was one that had reversing sensors or cameras, when in fact uh, um, Stability control and uh, you know uh, automatic braking and things like that would be far safer. Uh, but the perception was uh, that parking sensors or reversing sensors made the car safe. Um, so uh, design and planning, and you know I'm I'm making some general statements here, but you know car parks are expensive real estate, um, and so for town planners, um, designers. <clears throat> architects and so on. There are a lot of guidance uh, guidelines out there around um, uh, an expectation around minimum number of car parking spaces, um, and that's all factored into the design. Uh, but they have to compete with obviously the size of the building that's needed and to maximize the footprint of the building uh, that the car park is servicing, because the bigger the building, the more revenue uh, for that building tenant or owner or whatever. 
Um, and so it's not necessarily the car park that's generating the revenue, unless, of course, it's Melbourne Airport. Um, the access in and out of car parks, the service lanes tend to be uh, much narrower than we're more comfortable driving around, uh, certainly narrower than a lot of streets that we would drive around. Uh, the traffic flow is mainly two way and not one way. And, you know, even if it is one way, it's not mandatory, it's advisory. And how many times have we been in a, a car park with a one way traffic flow uh, only for somebody to uh, ignore those rules or that guidance? It's not really a rule, it's a guide. Uh, and of course, it's heavily reliant upon really good signage and demarcation arrows on the tarmac. And so this uh, is the slide that I thought Ron must have been looking over my shoulder when I was putting it together. So in Australia, the minimum car park space dimensions are 2.4 metres wide and 5.4 metres long. And yes, they may well uh, be adjusted and changed in the uh, latest review of the Australian standards. But the cars we are buying are getting bigger. Typically, that sort of US style pickup truck, uh, four wheel drives, SUVs, minivans, and so on. And how many times have we seen uh, instances like this where the vehicle really um, is pushing the boundary of the car park space? And there's a little rule uh, for me when I go into a car park. It's never be next to the SUV. Um, of course, uh, the cars parked either side of you may change whilst you're doing the shopping, uh, but don't go looking for trouble and parking beside a vehicle that is maximizing its footprint uh, in that car park space uh, because you're more often going to come back to your car with uh, little chips and dints in, in your door caused by maybe children uh, not, not aware and just open the door, the wind catches doors, et cetera, et cetera. Poor quality lighting, signage, inadequate speed restrictions, the way the uh, car parks uh, users interact with each other, particularly pedestrians, parking bay lines, the roadway painting, signage and so on, not often well maintained and a lot of wear and tear occurs and eventually they fade. Driver distraction, um, you know, driver distraction is a very ugly phenomenon. Uh, there's far too many features in vehicles these days. Uh, drivers are uh, increasingly competing with their focus and concentration on just simply driving. Uh, with all the technology in the car, conversations with uh, with with passengers, um, it could be children in the back seat. Uh, it could be looking all around them and being distracted by whatever uh, else is happening on the roadside rather than on the road. Um, any form of distraction when maneuvering in a vehicle in a confined space, whilst interacting between cars and with pedestrians, it just doesn't make sense. And quite often, as people um, you know, are, are leaving a car park, they may still be thinking about the shopping, uh, where they're driving to, uh, did they leave anything behind? Do they have their purse, wallet, phone, whatever? Um, if it's uh, leaving an office, uh, you're thinking about uh, the, the, the customer you're going to visit, or you may well be um, thinking, I've got all the right paperwork with me. Did I leave something at my desk? So often we're distracted um, if it's a, a business trip, a shopping trip or whatever. Um, so if, if you're the driver of a car and you're parking, avoid the distractions, solely focus for just a few seconds on the maneuver itself and combine reversing with reversing aids and a well-rehearsed reversing technique and reverse into that space. And you are more likely to uh, reverse into a space safely, slowly, uh, having concentrated on it, not being distracted without any damage whatsoever. And then of course, when it comes to leave that space, your exit strategy has clear 180 degree vision uh, left and right, and you can make your exit much, much safer. And we'll come on to that later on in the presentation. So here we are, reversing into a space. I sometimes become confounded with why people still drive into a space, uh, because it's surely not to avoid reversing. 
because they have to reverse out of the space. Unless they're extremely lucky, and if they are nose to tail with um, car park uh, uh, space in front of them that has become vacant and they can drive through, brilliant. If that occurs, um, very often go and buy lotto tickets uh, because it's extremely rare um, and it's not a strategy that I would rely upon. So whenever possible, um, reverse into a space. So we've got a poll here, and I did forget when the polls <laughs> would be coming out. So thanks for reminding me. So if everybody could uh, just take a second or two uh, to read this question and answer, if do you prefer reverse parking or front parking? So do you prefer reversing into a space, driving in, um, which tends to be the one that's frequently used by people, or do you like to drive, do, drive round and round and round and find that elusive double entry space so that you can drive through the first space into the second one, and therefore uh, you've not had to reverse, but you can drive out. Just take a couple more seconds to answer the question, and Jerome, are you able to, or Ruby, reveal the answers? Well, we, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised and pleased. Uh, we've obviously got some very learned people with us that are reverse parking. And we also have a few people uh, who like to drive around and find those uh, sort of double spaces. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it, um, but just be aware that often between uh, the space you drive into and the one in front of that, there can often be uh, some furniture, uh, street furniture, trees, bollards and so on so just be extremely careful of that uh, and hopefully we'll we'll be able to convert those uh, later that still drive into car parking spaces so thanks for the poll thanks for the participation um, and better than expected so thank you okay so um if you have a if you have a thing logically about ra arriving at your destination it doesn't matter if it's to do the the, the, the weekend shopping uh, to go clothes shopping, Christmas shopping, whatever it might be, a business trip, a delivery, visiting a customer or whatever. When you arrive, you, you feel much more calmer because you have arrived at your destination. Um, and this is just generally speaking, but you'll uh, be there hopefully on time. Uh, you will have less distractions uh, because you feel relaxed, you've arrived. And you can, if you reverse into a space you will tend to do that uh, at a much slower speed. You will take more time to be accurate uh, in setting up the car and reversing into the space using a variety of proven technique and technology. And you will uh, undoubtedly reverse into a space without any mishap. If you are leaving a car park space um, to go continue your to continue your journey, uh, or you're leaving the office to, to visit a customer and you have to reverse out, as you're leaving, you're probably less focused on the manoeuvre. You're thinking more about the customer you're going to see uh, or whoever it is you're going to go and see. Have I got all the paperwork? Am I running late? How do I get there? Uh, what's the best route? Um, is there any congestion? Uh, you'll remember the last time you went by such and such a way, it took longer. Uh, you'll maybe be fiddling with the GPS, sat-nav, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and so there's lots of distractions. And so if you're reversing out of a space, you will tend to do it marginally quicker than you would if you reversed into a space on arrival. And I you know, certainly would encourage you to think about that logically, uh, the difference between leaving to go to a destination, if you have to reverse out, uh, you're probably running late and your mind will be distracted by uh, many, many other topics and not the simple maneuver of reversing out of that space, coupled with major blind spot uh, and having to interact uh, with approaching vehicles uh, and everything else that we've talked about before. So reversing in allows us to leave that space with sufficient visibility, whereas reversing out doesn't. I'm just waiting for the slide to change. Didn't, let's try again. 
Okay. So parking tips, I won't go into uh, all of these in the interest of time and allowing time for questions at the end. We still have to talk about, you know, the ideal car park and so on. Um, but these slides will be made available to everybody. And there's a couple of slides here that I've taken from uh, our Zurich uh, risk guidance uh, sheets on parking tips. Um, and there's a lot more detail in those guides. But certainly being aware of your own blind spots in your car is something that sadly not, not enough of us do. And you should know your own limitations. And uh, often, you know, if you take the keys of a, a new car uh, or a car you've never driven before, if you can uh, use something like, I don't know, traffic cones or whatever, start to uh, you know, go to a quiet car park space somewhere and start to lay out the cones and then get familiar with uh, when you lose sight of those cones in your mirrors or through your uh, uh, rear window, and then jump out of the car and just see how big that blind spot is. Remember the slide I showed earlier where SUVs and pickups tend to have greater front and rear blind spots. It's a really good exercise just to become more familiar with just how big in meters, not centimeters, how big that blind spot uh, actually is uh, around your vehicle. Remember to you know, the, the old adage of mirror signal maneuver still applies to car parks. I think it's um, sadly forgotten a lot of times and maybe even contributes to a little bit of car park rage. Uh, always exaggerate your movements slowly um, and you know, anticipate uh, pedestrians, particularly children in car parks. Um, so I'll just move on to some of the other slides. Uh, this has a, a lot more detail around you know, assessing the vehicle and windows, mirrors, blind spots, um, checking for potential hazards. Um, I always think it's a good idea when approaching your car in a car park to, you know, approach it from behind and do one quick lap because there may be obstacles around the car that have appeared uh, since you parked it, even broken glass and things like that. Uh, it's always good practice to approach your car and do one lap of it, uh, just to anticipate if there's something lurking uh, in a blind spot uh, before you uh, maneuver out of the space. Uh, always take your time whenever reversing. Uh, use the, the, the vehicle controls, the steering wheel, mirrors, and uh, looking over your shoulder left and right. We'll carry on, but of course you'll have all of these. Now, there is a right way and a wrong way or a better way uh, to uh, reverse into a car park space. Uh, for us here in Australia, by you know, driving on um, you know, the left-hand side of the road, we're sat in the right-hand side of the car. Uh, so reversing into a space, it's always better, uh, marginally better to look over your right shoulder uh, and reverse into a car park space on your right, which is a little bit counterintuitive to what we would normally do, because if you're driving uh, in a two-way access lane in a car park, uh, everybody tends to reverse into a car park space on their left-hand side. Unfortunately, it's a tighter angle, unless you want to obstruct oncoming traffic on already tight, narrow access lanes in a car park and go over to the right slightly and then reverse into that car park space on the left. But even still, looking over your left shoulder means that you have greater blind spot than if you looked over your right shoulder. So give it a go sometime whenever you're parking um, and you'll find that uh, it's actually, although slightly counterintuitive, it's better to reverse into a car park space on your right-hand side. The angle is less tight and you have greater visibility. Okay, uh, some, just some uh, further information to consider uh, if you're designing a car park um, at a sort of more strategic level, or if you own a car park um, and you have the opportunity to modify it, extend it, or whatever, uh, have a think on uh, some general features of a car park that will actually make it uh, more um, safer by design. And that is traffic flow. If at all possible, try and encourage one-way traffic flow. With, through good signage uh, and so on, and even just curbing around entrances and exits makes it uh, almost intuitive that you can only drive in one way, for instance, 
Um, signage is all important, uh, but also be careful of sign clutter. Um, consider reverse angle parking, and we'll touch on this a little bit later. The lighting in car parks, somebody was talking earlier about underground car parks, certainly the use of uh, LED technology not only reduces uh, the amount of electricity used, uh, but it tends to be a much brighter light uh, and that increases the visibility. Always impose speed restrictions. There's no right or wrong speed, but you tend to find that the slower the speed restriction, the slower people will drive. They'll not necessarily adhere to the five kilometer an hour speed limit, but they're more likely to do 10 kilometers an hour. Whereas if you had said 10 kilometers an hour uh, as your speed limit in a car park, they might do much more than that. So it's just mind over matter a little bit, but the lower the speed restriction, the better. Think about pedestrian and traffic interaction and minimize the number of times pedestrians would have to cross over uh, the flow of traffic and also try and avoid, if it's possible, them uh, having to walk between rows of cars facing each other, unless you have a raised footpath in between. Think about line demarcation. Uh, there's a lot of technology these days in road marking paints that uh, increases visibility because of reflectant uh, chips built into the paint. Uh, think about the color uh, of, of the, uh, the lines as well. Um, there's a bit of a science to it and uh, certainly it helps with identifying arrows that support one way flow, the demarcation of spaces and so on. Uh, highlight stationary objects, post bollards uh, with um, you know high vis type uh, reflectors. Uh, if you can avoid a lot of those stationary objects, uh, please do so. And just be mindful too when we um, we consider charging stations in car parks as well. Um, regular inspections and maintenance uh, is important as well and often gets overlooked. Okay, mindful of time, the ideal car park. Whoops, do I go backwards? Sorry. And here's the ideal car park, the empty one. Uh, of course, uh, tongue in cheek, joke for uh, uh, as we get on towards the end of the day. But there are uh, better ways of demarking car parks, and in particular, the reverse angle park. If we look at the car park on the left hand side, you can see clearly nice, clear white lines demarking angle parking and again good news it's got one-way traffic flow and in the left hand side in, um, in this instance you drive in uh, driving from uh, left to right at the bottom of that car park and it, the angle park is sort of forces you to drive nose in to an angle park the problem with that is that driver sat in the sort of right hand top corner of the vehicle when they come to exit, it will not be guaranteed all those empty spaces. They could be full. And they're going to have to reverse out of the space with maximum blind spot and into the flow of oncoming traffic. So that is a bit of an issue. And if we look at the picture on the right-hand side and look at the change in flow of the traffic, this forces you to reverse angle park so you drive past the space and then you reverse back in now it's important that you signal your intent early so that if there's cars behind you they can stop sufficiently so that you can reverse into that space and that will help when you come to leave again all those spaces could be full you are in the right hand uh, drive car so you are at the front of the vehicle and as you pull out of that space you have maximum visibility just glancing to your left and you can see the one-way traffic flow approaching you and you will avoid incidents much uh, more frequently in that kind of parking style. Now this idea of reverse angle parking is really catching on particularly around Canada and the USA. Um, they're really promoting it uh, with a lot of town planners uh, and, and a lot of you know, cities and towns in, in America adopting this, uh, particularly uh, for uh, curbside or roadside parking. Um, now, there is a little video which I think is important to play. 
I hope that uh, the audio will work. If it doesn't, we might have to tweak it, uh, but here goes. Well, they always say never work with children, animals, and video in PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> uh, Ruby, are you able to? I'll give it a go. There we go. Back in, angle parking is coming to our city streets in the Chains District. Changing on street parallel parking to back in, angled stalls will increase the number of parking spaces available in busy areas of the city. This type of parking is safer for drivers and passengers when getting into and out of a vehicle. It's a new concept for Winnipeg drivers, but parking in back in angle stall. Find an open stall and signal to let others know you intend to park. Two, drive past the stall and stop. Three, reverse into the space using your side mirrors to view the lines. Now you're safely parked. And when you're ready to leave, it's easy to see oncoming vehicle traffic, cyclists and pedestrians. To learn more, visit winnipeg.ca slash angle parking pilot. Okay, thanks. Uh... Thanks, Ruby, for rescuing me there and <laughs> getting that video to play. Um, and you can, uh, when you receive the, the slide deck, you'll be able to uh, locate that YouTube video. Or if you just search reverse angle parking Winnipeg, you'll be able to find that. Now, certainly in that video, it looked like uh, the, the cars are driving on the left hand side of the road, when in fact, in Winnipeg, you actually drive on the right. I'm assuming that this is uh, a one way street or it's a service road of some kind. And so um, they would be driving uh, with park, parking spaces uh, either on the left or the right. But for the purposes of this illustration, it happened to be uh, on the left-hand side of the street. Okay, um, let's rush through the last couple of uh, remaining slides. That's it. And that's it, yeah, good, excellent. Oh. Uh, we probably only have uh, five or 10 minutes. I know there was a lot of questions. Uh, popping up in the in the Q&A, but I didn't uh, pay any uh, attention to those. Otherwise, I would have been distracted while driving this presentation. No worries, man. Well, thank you so much. Let me dive on in. And I think this has been an easy one from Richard. Does your insurance data provide any information on travel speeds when an accident occurs? Obviously, in a forward moving, not reversing motion. Uh, no, it doesn't. <clears throat> um, often, um, the, the information that insurance companies get uh, from a claim form uh, is relatively limited um, and also uh, to get the actual speed from a driver uh, when they're reversing um, they that would mean that they were distracted at looking at their speed or when they're reversing so um, and it, it, it wouldn't be accurate anyway um, so it's very hard to tell uh, with any precision what speed they'd been tra uh, traveling at when reversing a um, question here from David, and further on drawing on your data. Regarding the insurance claim stats, is there any data relating to the number and severity of vehicles and pedestrian collisions? That's a very good question. Um, we could actually do the same uh, analysis as I alluded to earlier. We got all of our reversing, hitting stationary objects and um, uh, well, damage was park wouldn't apply here, but we could do instead of searching for the word park or parking, we could look for the uh, the word pedestrian, uh, and then that would be, or we, we we can search in other ways where there's been uh, a third party injury, perhaps uh, of a third party. Um, but yeah, there would be ways of doing that. So it's it's a good suggestion, and I'll I'll uh, pass that one on to the claims team at Zurich and see if we can come up with some useful statistics. And we can circulate that back out to everyone who attends it today. So that'd be great. Thank you, Mo. Um, there's a question here from Andrew. Uh, probably goes back a little bit further in your presentation where you said, what about vehicle heights? So I guess yeah, it, it, it's a good point. Um, um, thankfully, a lot of car parks will have, um, you know, uh, metal uh, barriers uh, outside the car park entrance if there is any kind of height restriction inside. 
so they're um they're sort of sacrificial in a way um so that if you if you happen to hit that um whilst it still may do some damage to your vehicle it isn't going to do significant damage in the car park itself um but um i we we, we we're actually seeing less vehicle height related incidents uh, of the vehicle height itself the problem is people putting things on the roof of the vehicle uh, we can't really legislate for that uh, so a lot of trade vehicles uh, a lot of people with um, luggage racks uh, bicycles skiing equipment all that sort of thing uh, often the driver may well be familiar with the own vehicle height and might even frequent the same car park with the height restriction without any of that material on the roof. But of course, when they go back to the car park again with their very expensive uh, bicycles on the roof, uh, it could be a recipe for disaster. So it can be a bit of a problem, um, but it's more to do with other um, features being uh, added onto the top of the vehicle. I'll just launch the last um, poll and whilst that's up, we'll just bounce for another couple of questions. So we're keen to hear your thoughts on, uh, um, on this. Have, has this webinar changed your way you park? So launching this now. Um, whilst everyone's considering that, question here from Mick Timms. Um, does insurance claim data indicate an overrepresentation of older drivers or any other demographic? Um. Well, it, for, for doing the research uh, for this in particular, we didn't um, differentiate between the age of drivers. Um, the study that uh, took place in Britain, I do believe that the reason for the high uh, proportion of 44% uh, of, dri of, of uh, people in the study um, said that they relied upon the reversing age. And I think there was some further comment that um, that that 44% was overrepresented by younger drivers uh, because they were uh, either more familiar with the technology um, or they were driving cars that had that technology included. I do apologise that we're just going slightly over and um, there's some interesting results for you there, Merv, Kyler and Ruby. Yeah, just try to see that. Okay, well, I'm... Um... I'm hoping that the yes, uh, people who will change the way you park are solely those people who uh, said that they drove into a space or drove round and round until they found two spaces uh, uh, face to face. Uh, and the ones that said no are the ones who are already reverse parking. <laughs> um, I just, I'm just picked up, while I'm looking through the, uh, the comments now um and questions and i'm just reading ron's one police but your comment that road markings and car parks you no know, i don't think i said that their road markings are not mandatory i didn't I don't think i said that the road markings would comply with the road rules i agree with you there ron um not really sure what i said if i misled you uh, about that so apologies for that but yes the uh, the, the markings would be mandatory uh, to be applied, sorry, adhered to. So if there are arrows saying, you know, one way, uh, that's true. What I mean is, um, how many times have you seen people ignore those? And uh, when it comes into an insurance uh, claim or whatever, um, it's sometimes extremely difficult and time consuming uh, to go down that path of, of proving who is wrong or right. People are less likely to go down a one way street the wrong way than down a, a one-way access road at a car park is probably what I was meaning. Any more questions that you want me to, to, um, to tackle, well, Jerome? We'll, we'll grab one here from Ryan. And it's, and it's this interesting point. I was just reflecting on um, conversations I've had with McDonald, McDonald's and banks and those sort of ones, and they've actually been saying one well, of the biggest risks they have are some of the older Australians, when they park, they get priority in driving into their restaurants and you reflect on this if they make a mistake if you actually reverse in that risk would probably not be there yeah true yeah right Ryan makes a good couple of comments i'm just mm. uh, reading both of these uh as well uh, let me see and on the on the technology saying... side i think um there's there's a reversing a um aeb now that the ancap sort of testing and, and talking about yeah yeah look, the, undoubtedly the technology will become i guess so superior um, and as cars become more autonomous as well, um, 
there's likely to be less and less driver error when it uh, comes to, to parking the car. And certainly I have been in cars that have, you know, the uh, automated parking. Um, and it is one of the weirdest things to experience. And if you ever want to get close to a, you know, a, a sort of semi-autonomous or autonomous vehicle, um, we at least experience the automatic reversing. Uh, it does it with, you know, really good accuracy. My concern is that I felt whilst in the vehicle doing the automated uh, parallel park, um, it took too long. It, it, for me, it felt like it was taking longer than if I was doing it myself. And I do worry about the consequences of road rage. If, you're, if you were behind that vehicle uh, and it was in the automated mode and it took longer, um, you might get a little bit impatient. I don't know. Um, but certainly, Ryan also mentions that you know, in the USA, uh, the ideal car park that we showed there uh, is, is very much the default design. We're certainly seeing it increase more and more. It's not occurring beyond there. It's not happening, as far as I can tell, in, in the UK and Europe. And why it isn't happening uh, in Australia, I, I don't know. We have so much space. Um, we're, we're relatively new uh, as a country and, and time planning. Um, it should be a given. And uh, certainly, I, I hope it's something that we can encourage and see a lot more of. Well, I just want to say thank you guys very much. We have a couple of questions. We'll just, as I said, we've got some actions to follow up with Zurich with some data on and everything. And there will be an email with the presentation, everything coming out. There will be a survey as well. We'd welcome your feedback on this. And um, next month, we have Daniel Brain from Toll Group, and we have a number of other webinars coming up. So thank you, Kyla, Ruby. Amazing effort with the organisation campaign. Super proud to see how it's come together. And Merv, always a pleasure to have you on board and um, hear your wisdom and, and how you sort of mentored and tutored Kyla and Ruby as they went along as well. So thank you very much. No problem at all. Richard Watson does bring up a really, really important feature here, and that is the introduction of cycle lanes and how uh, that would interact. Um, big debate, big, big conversation, but I would rather we saw that the cycle lanes were on the left-hand side of the car park, you know what I mean? Not the one going right up the side uh, where a car would reverse into that space. So uh, hard to describe, but a uh, bit closer to the footpath and not roadside maybe, I don't know. Great question to close out with and some food for thought. Yeah. So. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. And thank you to our uh, attendees who are listening today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.